I now would like to have this pleasure of introducing the second session of the day. The session is entitled Translating the Green Economy Promise into Practice. Please join me in welcoming the moderator for the session, Mr. Yuvo de Boer, part partner of SRI Executive, along with the speakers, and they are as follows. Ms. Aisha al abduli Director of the Green Development Department at the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment in the United Arab Emirates. Her Excellency Dr. Sylvia Vilo, Under Secretary of State at the Ministry for the Environment and Protection of Land and Sea in Italy. And last but not least, Adam Bakshish, Chief of the Division for Arab States, Europe and CIS at UNDP. Please welcome them. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And as was said just now, welcome to this second panel discussion. It's very exciting for me personally to be back at the World Green Economy Summit again, an, an annual experience of both intellectual discussion and then technology being demonstrated across the road, which I personally think is a perfect balance. We have some big challenges for this session. Basically, what we would like to try and do in the time that we have available is to touch on five issues. Um, first of all, the, some of the global trends beyond just climate and energy that are shaping the shift of the global economy in a greener direction. Secondly, to talk about multi-stakeholder partnerships, public-private partnerships, and how those are critical to advancing the green economy agenda. Thirdly, around that, to show some examples of successful green economy initiatives that, that are working, and all of the panelists will be able to give examples of that. And then move on to talk a little bit about successful government models and how governments can drive change uh, also within the private sector. And then finally end, I hope, by talking a little bit about the international architecture uh, around the green economy and what can be done to innovate that international architecture uh, and make it more effective. So those are our objectives in the little time that we have available. I wanted to start off a little bit by painting a broader, a broader picture. Uh, a lot of the conversation so far today has been about energy innovation against the backdrop of Climate change is a global challenge. But I would actually argue that at, at the moment, as humanity, we are probably confronted by 10 major global challenges. Yes, around energy. Yes, around climate. But also on food security, water security, the increase of material prices, the loss of biodiversity, which was mentioned uh, just now, deforestation uh, in the shape of three other trends that we are responsible for, which is population increase, urbanization, and wealth increase. And those 10 trends together, and I really believe it's important to see them together, are taking the global economy in a fundamentally different direction. Uh, a couple of years ago, I decided to, to look into that a little bit more deeply and did a report that looked at 10 major sectors of the global economy to ask the question, what would happen if humanity were to take those 10 trends seriously? What would that mean for the global economy? And my conclusion was that it would have very major impacts. To give you, for example, to give you just one example, if humanity were to take those 10 global trends seriously, and if those trends were to translate into a different kind of policy environment that's aligned with change, then just as one example, the consumer goods industry would see its profits wiped out three times over. In other words, it is imperative that we change the model of the global economy. So that's the backdrop. What is the emerging political answer to that? Over the past couple of years, we have seen some very important trends at the international level. And three very important things happened in 2014. The first is that the international community adopted a series of sustainable development goals, a sustainable development agenda 
that embraces, that encompasses the whole international community. Those sustainable development goals were preceded by millennium development goals, which were mainly focused on developing countries. But now we have an agenda to which the whole international community subscribes. Secondly, and it's very related to that, in 2014, we had a big climate change conference in Paris, which led to the whole international community, with two exceptions to date, but pretty much the whole international community committing to take action on climate change in a way that is aligned with national priorities. And the third important political development in 2014 actually <coughs> happened in the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa, where a conference took place on financing for development, which basically put the whole international finance agenda, the, the finance engine behind development in a different context, focusing much more on the mobilization of domestic capital and on the need to engage the private sector. So we understand the global trends and we have the political response to the global trends, but at the same time we find that realities sometimes resist the transitions. Often because people do not yet <coughs> fully understand how the transition to a greener economy can be made in a way that is economically viable, societally acceptable. And our panel today will be focusing on a number of the uh, experiences that countries have, that organizations have, in terms of, uh, of making that transition to a different model of, of economic growth. The panelists have, uh, have already been introduced, but, but let me introduce them very briefly again. Uh, firstly, in the middle, uh, Aisha Al-Abduli, who I hope will tell us a lot about the fascinating experience that the UAE has gone through in terms of shaping a green economy strategy. <coughs> All the Emirates embracing that strategy and a strong uh, engagement of the private sector and, uh, and, and local authorities. Secondly, immediately on my left, uh, Silvia Vello, who is Under Secretary of State in the <coughs> Ministry of Italy with the most beautiful name in the world, the Ministry of Environment, Sea and Land, or Land and Sea, what protection. could... Protection. Protection, yes. Protection of environment, land and sea. Well, what could be beyond, uh, beyond that? And Italy has a fascinating experience in terms of, of greening economic growth and green challenges, both at home, but also a very, very um, ambitious and active program of international cooperation, working together with other countries, and I hope you'll say something about your cooperation with, uh, with developing countries. And then Eden Bakshish uh, from UNDP, who is focused on South-South on cooperation. I think quite a lot of the discussion this morning has been on, on very well-developed economies, uh, stable financial systems. But I hope that Edom is going to say something about the challenges facing developing countries, and in fact, some of the very interesting cooperation that we're actually <coughs> beginning to see happen on, uh, on, on a South-South basis. But I wanted to start off this uh, of this discussion by asking uh, each of the panelists whether you recognize that picture of global trends and the policy response that I uh, painted, and if you could maybe give an example of some successes, successes that you're already seeing in terms of responding to those emerging global challenges. And uh, perhaps, Sylvia, you'll allow me to start with you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for our question. For, um, Thank you for this occasion, very important, uh, uh, a global important occasion, but also an important occasion for our country. You know that uh, our country in the European contest uh, is, very is very committed uh, to these issues, uh, both the re uh, to reach uh, the goals of uh, the Agenda 2030 and to reach uh, the issue of uh, uh, Paris Agreement. Uh, Italy, with the European countries, uh, worked in Paris to reach, uh, to, to, to write in the uh, pre, uh, Paris Agreement the 1.5 degrees, uh, 2 degrees almost, but uh, preferably 1.5 degrees. And Italy is also 
very committed to reach the, NDC, the NDCs for uh, 2030 agenda, internal NDCs and with uh, program of cooperation, uh, global uh, NDCs. Um, I, I could start with internal, uh, our internal commitment. Uh, during 2015, uh, the years of, of Paris Agreement and 2030 <coughs> Agenda Agreement, in Italy we um, approved a law, a general law, the first Italian law who um, have the, the, the word green economy. Uh, the word green economy appeared the first time in 2015 in, a law, in an Italian uh, law. This law contained a first package of measures, uh, various measures, uh, and instruments to ac accelerate the Italian uh, transition uh, from uh, linear economy to green economy and possibly to circular uh, economy. And uh, the first article of this law um, uh, say that Italy have to provide to, uh, a national strategy for sustainable de development. The last edition of, of which was of uh, 2002. Uh, the provision was a great opportunity for my ministry and um, we, mm, this is consist uh, with the social, economical, and environmental goals of 2030. Uh, we worked with <coughs> our, the other colleagues of the other ministries, and uh, you can imagine that uh, not all the ministries are so committed as the, our ministry to reach the goals of 2030 agenda. But this work was good and uh, we presented our national uh, review of uh, 2030 agenda last July in New York during the uh, high-level political forum. Then we had a domestic consult public consultation on <laughs> this agenda, and now this agenda is at the examination of a, a Council of Ministry, and we think that we um, uh, approve the finit the, uh, on, on before the end of these um, of these uh, years, we we have the ambition to make this a, the core of the action on in all fields of the action of our government. So, uh, economic uh, fields, development field, the social and 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 so on, uh, agriculture, energy, industry, and uh, so on. Uh, we uh, are very improved uh, among all in the sector of uh, renewable energies and uh, in energy efficiency. It's a very, <coughs> a com Italy is very committed on this. But uh, the law, uh, if I can say uh, briefly, include also other important issues. Uh, first, the introduction uh, of an yearly report on, the, on environmentally harmful and favorable subsites to monitor and assess subsites and coherent with the Paris Agreement and, and with other environmental targets. Uh, the law uh, established a, a natural capital committee whose members are either government representative or uh, scientific ex expert. Um, and uh, we, we have to charge a drawing up of uh, early report on the state of, nation, of natural uh, national capital. And another important um, issue of the laws is a public procurement of goods and services in order to promote the purchase of green products uh, with the balanced approach between economic cost and environmental benefits. And so on, other issues uh, uh, contained in, in this law. <coughs> then we work, so that I can continue later, on the, um, with the, in the European context, in the uh, transition to, from a carbon economy and the production of energy, uh, from uh, fuel and to the production uh, of energy with renewable energy, and also a, the re a reform of um, financial uh, taxation. But I can speak about yep. this later. Okay. Good. Well, thank you very much for that.
Uh, Aisha, can I ask you the, the same question? Um, do you recognize my picture of, of, of global change, the response of the international community, and, and, and how has the UAE been responding to those challenges? Well, first of all, I am delighted to be here today in this panel and to share UAE experience in this regard. How did we transform toward the green economy? I would say that we had started uh, from the objective of UAE Vision 2021, uh, which we aim to be among the best countries in the world by 2021. So in 2012, our um, Prime Minister, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, had already uh, launched a long-term initiative to transform our country and our economy to a green economy under the UAE Green Growth Strategy uh, with the slogan, Green Economy for Sustainable Development. In 2015, our cabinet, UAE cabinet, had already approved the implementation plan for that strategy, which we called it the Green Agenda 2030. And from that time, we are working all as a federal and local and private sector to implement actually that green agenda for the country. And that uh, agenda is already governed by UAE Council for Climate Change and Environment, which has in its membership uh, uh, representatives from the key ministries in the country and uh, also representatives from the seven Emirates. So we see that this strong visionary leadership that we have in our country with the um, uh, clear strategy and the strong as well council or strong governance structure uh, to uh, uh, the governance structure in our country, it show that green economy is a truly nationwide initiative and efforts that we take it seriously, and we are steering its uh, course of development toward achieving green objectives and economic growth at the same time. So uh, keeping this in mind, we also uh, thought that it's very important to measure the progress. So it's not only setting the strategies and the implementation plan, but as well we need to measure our progress in transforming toward, uh, toward the green economy. That's why we had developed a guideline or a toolkit of 41 green key performance indicators that cover the social, economic, and environmental aspects in our transformation. And uh, yesterday, our uh, minister, His Excellency Dr. Sani Ziyoudi, UAE Minister of Climate Change and Environment, had launched the first of its uh, kind in the world, a national guideline actually for measuring the transformation of, uh, to, toward the green economy. And that uh, reference guideline, we had already took also the, uh, the information that we utilize it in the international references from OECD and from UNIB and uh, the Global Green Growth Institute. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy to have a first copy of this guideline here with me. And I'm sure that our colleagues here can distribute extra copies for, for the audience as well. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Um, Edom, if, if I could see you as the representative of the, the whole global south, and please give me your personal answer to the following question, not the official UNDP answer, but your personal answer. Do you, I talked about the sustainable development goals as being a truly global agenda. Do you think that that applies to developing countries? Are developing countries seeing the sustainable development goals as their agenda? And are they managing to integrate the sustainable development goals with their ambitions around poverty eradication and economic growth? So are the sustainable development goals really owned by the global south? Uh, thank you very much, Evo, thank you. Uh, and also before, before uh, responding to your important question, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the World Green Economy Organization, the government of the UAE for, on behalf of the UN Office for South-South Cooperation that is hosted by UNDP, uh, for an opportunity to be here today. Uh, and before answering the question, I would like to ask our distinguished participants to try to answer to yourselves if uh, you know what the Global South means, because the term is, not, is more than 30 years old, but. Uh, still uh, uh, it doesn't harm explaining. Uh, Global South is the totality of the developing countries. Officially, as of today, I think it's 
133 members of the uh, group of 77 and China uh, of the United Nations General Assembly. Um, <clears throat> I'm asking this because most of my presentation, as Eva was mentioning, is to, to make a point on behalf of the Global South. And if I had to condense what I wanted to say in one sentence, I would say that tapping into the potential of South-South cooperation, in addition to traditional forms of cooperation, uh, could be a potential game changer for the people in the countries facing similar challenges in climate change, in poverty alleviation, many other problems that shape up the sustainable development agenda. So the answer is, of course, yes, the countries in the global south, the developing countries do share, do own the sustainable development agenda, and a lot is being done. <coughs> uh, I would also like to mention that the countries in the global south may be not obvious uh, at a glance, but they're one of the most motivated stakeholders, and the stakeholder that has a vested interest in the success of the work that the World Green Economy Organization is doing. Because not only that they benefit a lot from the change, they suffer a lot from, from lack of change. And before speaking about successful examples, as you asked uh, in your previous question, I would like to add one additional facet to, 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 to a number of problems that are being addressed uh, by, by, by the green economy. I'm talking about the situation where the, um, maybe it is unfortunate, it's my personal opinion as you were asking, uh, that uh, economic success in our realities oftentimes directly correlates with increased, unsustainably growing uh, rates of consumption. And the problem here is uh, so-called built-in obsolescences, uh, where the products are designed to be obsolete intentionally after a certain period of time. They work for a while, we're used to them, but then they stop working suddenly. And they can continue working in, in principle, but they're designed to stop working. And the rationale behind is that the companies expect that they can earn more and they have to compete for earning more for the market shares uh, because uh, the, the purchases of a similar product will be more frequently repeated. That's, uh, of course, something that is not uh, sustainable. And uh, part of the problem is that the companies that adhere to these practices, they uh, do not consider the value as a whole in its totality they not take into consideration the elements of the human, social, environmental capitals, in addition to financial capital. And uh, as I said, computers, phones, uh, washing machines, they work and at some point they stop working, we have to buy the new ones. And if we ask ourselves where all these old phones go, what happens with the old computers, uh, I would like to bring an example of a place in Accra, in Ghana. Uh, it's, uh, it's a country in Africa, as you know, uh, where one specific neighborhood is just a never-ending field of mobile phones, old mobile phones. It has become the largest in the world uh, junkyard for the wasted uh, electronics. Before, it was the countries in Asia, mainly China and India, that received about 70% of the electronic waste from around the world. But now the wealthy nations, they have, uh, they're mostly uh, sending their ele electronic waste to, to the countries in Africa. And it is illegal. In many countries, uh, export of uh, electronic waste is illegal. But uh, there is a roundabout. They send it with uh, this, uh, this hardware with the, a label of, uh, second-hand uh, merchandise to uh, bridge the digital divide. Whereas in reality, most of this merchandise is un useless, it's unworkable. So uh, I would like to bring an analogy, speaking about the global south, the developing countries, and the wealthy nations. I would like to bring an analogy of somebody who has just a slight headache, and then somebody who knows that the action has to be taken today because I'm bleeding. 
the countries in the wealthy nations, the organizations, the institutions, entire sectors, they know that potentially it can become a problem that sometime in the future, maybe our generation may face this issue. But the countries in the global south, they suffer today from the contamination of water, contamination, pollution of air, contamination of soil, uh, generation-wide health issues. They see and feel their body bleeding. That's why uh, I would like to make an argument that the global south, the developing countries, are a very strong ally for the work of the World Green Economy Organization. They are a very strong ally for the change towards greener economies. Okay, thank you. I, I want to continue uh, a little bit on that theme of, of, of economic transformation and, and how you can prompt that. Um, Aisha, you, you talked about the, the UAE green performance indicators that were presented yesterday, I think you said. Um, if, if I look in that, um, that framework, the, the first heading is, is, is measuring the green economy transformation. Critical to the green economy transformation and, and measuring that transformation and guiding that transformation is engagement with the private sector. So what are you doing in the UAE to create partnerships with the private sector to drive this green economy transition? Uh, in order to answer this question, I would like to start with another question. Okay. How can we actually realize the country's uh, green economy transformation? So there are actually three key enablers, finance, technologies, and policies. If we look at those uh, or whatever great ideas we have, we cannot implement them if we don't have the uh, proper finance for that. And even the uh, development of the technologies, the efficient technologies, we can't develop them. We can't also bring the cost down if we don't have finance available. So for that, I would say that the role of the government was actually uh, to um, enable the policy and the institutional framework to match the technologies with the finance. So if we look at the private sector, the private sector had actually holds two of those enablers, the finance and the technologies. So therefore, we at United Arab Emirates, when we de developed our Green Agenda 2030 and the National Climate Change Plan that was adopted in June by our cabinet this year, we had emphasized the role of a private sector contribution toward achieving those goals. So in, in United Arab Emirates, we uh, as a government pushing the public-private partnership and whereby the private sector can actually benefit from participating or financing the mega projects. Already a number of large scale solar power projects have been rapidly developed uh, through mainly power purchase agreements between the developers and the governments. And we can highlight some of those examples here in UAE. So in 2013, we remember that Mustard had commenced already the operation of Shams One, one of the world's largest concentrated solar power plant. And in that, they had developed it with Total and uh, Abingo Solar for a total cost of 600 million US dollar. Uh, if we come to Dubai, then Dubai Mohammed bin Rashid Solar Park, which now aims to expand 5,000 megawatt capacity by 2030 is actually one of the leading drivers in the world for driving down the cost of solar PV plants, leveraging the economy of uh, scale and technology advancement. Uh, the bidding as well for Abu Dhabi latest mega PV project broke the world record at 2.42 US cents per kilowatt hour. And the latest news is that uh, Diwa has announced that it selected Aqua Power and Shanghai Power to build a 700 megawatt CSP plant in Mohammed bin Rashid Solar Park, providing the capacity of the initial, uh, uh, the capacity of like more than three times the initial capacity. And uh, the plant will deliver energy at 7.3 US cent uh, per kilowatt hour. So UAE's power purchase agreement model has become one of the leading drivers in the world for driving down the cost of solar PV plants through public-private partnership as it leverages the economy of scale and technology advancement. Okay, thank you. 
Everything that you've all said so far has been very positive. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about barriers and about problems. Um, Sylvia, when you, you talked about the, the law that Italy has introduced and you, uh, you talked about getting all of the ministries on board with that strategy, you smiled a little bit, so obviously it wasn't always easy. Um, you also talked about some of the challenges that you're trying to address through the law for example, around environmentally harmful subsidies and, and how can those be removed. Can, can you say a little bit more about the, the main barriers that you see that prevent the shift to the green economy and how, through the policy, through the law, you are trying to address those barriers? Yeah, um, we have, um, maybe we have, uh, on the private sector, uh, many initiatives, for, uh, many companies that uh, had uh, ideas, technologies, and uh, project to to product uh, uh, to work in green economy, and uh, we have to work in two direction. One, the, uh, the law. I saw about the law, the general law because we have a very severe uh, legislation about the use of the waste, the end of waste, uh, and uh, a, a European uh, legislation. And we are working within the European contest, uh, which uh, approved a package on circular economy. Uh, a package we are uh, consulting in Italy, and uh, we have uh, we are producing we have product a national paper uh, with a public consultation an Italian position paper for uh, the European Parliament. But we think we are very committed to approve this uh, pack, European package on European uh, on circular economy because this is important, this is, will be fundamental to have a European and then a national legislation which uh, remove all barriers to reach the uh, green and um, to pass from a linear economy to a circular economy with the reuse of uh, materials. Uh, to stop the consumption of natural capital, of uh, mineral, water, uh, soil, and so on. The second aspect we are working on is the um, taxation. We are working, and this is more difficult than the first one, but because we, we have to work to an environmental f fiscal reform that in which we with which to remove uh, environmentally harmful subsides, namely uh, fossil fuel subsides. Uh, and this is very difficult because uh, there are companies and the sector of our economies which uh, are not so happy <laughs> to have mm -hmm. these transition, these reforms. But this, uh, we have to uh, learn, we have to um, uh, to be sure that these subsides are not useful. These subsides are ineffic inefficient and they encourage the wasteful consumption and production uh, and they encourage, the, uh, they contribute to a, live, a high level of greenhouse gas emission. So Italy have to reach this issue so uh, and so and uh, er, to develop green finance, and uh, for this we encourage uh, multilateral de development banks uh, to align their portfolio with the Paris Agreement goals to limit global temperatures, as I said, not only to two degrees Celsius, but preferably to 1.5 degrees. Um, 
we uh, encourage uh, we are encouraging financial centers to work all together in an international network they met in casablanca at uh, the end of september and we host there uh, in milan in march and this is uh, the occasion to to encourage uh, all the financial center from uh, uh, to join this occasion uh, on these issues before competition make problem we have large areas of cooperation for supporting green economy and sustainable development we have to decide that, uh, that this is our global uh, priority our global priority let me move um, south a, li a little bit again. Um, Adam, there was a, a finance panel earlier this morning um, where financiers were talking about uh, how green investments are increasing, how the price of technology is going down, how um, very big and very significant projects are, are being realized. Uh, my sense is that story is, is very true for robust, large, developed, established economies. That the story is slightly different in, in many developing countries where the risks are very high, uh, interest rates are very high, returns are sometimes very low. Uh, the policy environment is not always conducive and many, many projects are too small to really take the interests of big institutional investors. If, if you look at the landscape of developing countries trying to embrace these sustainable development goals, where is it that you feel developing countries need most international support? Is it on redesigning regulation, redesigning financial instruments, um, where do you see the, the, the biggest need in the Global South? Thank you very much. Uh, I would both agree and disagree with you. Okay. I would agree that certainly developing countries are facing a number of challenges that are very specific to their developing context. But at the same time, uh, we may all notice that actually the developing countries, the Global South, is not homogeneous. There are wealthier countries, there are poorer countries, but the overall trend is that the financial power of the global south is growing. And that's why when earlier I spoke about the developing countries as a main beneficiary, uh, I'm also equally confident speaking about uh, developing world, the global south being uh, and becoming day by day one of the major contributors to the change towards uh, better, more sustainable, greener economic models. Um, one specific thing that uh, I think needs to be pointed out is that there are a lot of successful initiatives. Uh, we, we uh, our UN Office for South South Cooperation was invited to organize uh, a networking summit during uh, the Global Expo in Astana in June. Actually, uh, it was on the sidelines of the Astana Economic Forum where the theme was new energy, new economy. So they're trying to bring it to the level of the region. Uh, the ideas are there, but, uh, and also the private sector institutions. Some of them, they, they start to understand the importance of uh, adhering to the sustainable practices. But the main point and the main problem is that all these initiatives, they're, by now, they're ad hoc. And until the time when they stay ad hoc, until the time when, uh, uh, we get to a concerted action, doing it together until the time we get the critical mass of these initiatives towards sustainable green economy. Uh, the problem of unsustainable economic practices is not going to be solved. Another point I want to make, I think it's important to make it, that <coughs> unsustainable economic practices are contagious. Uh, to make it simpler for us to, to understand, again, I would like to bring an analogy. Uh, if we think about, for a second, about 10 survivors stranded in the sea, trying to survive, waiting for somebody to find them, they agree that 
to save time and to buy time, they are going to only make three gulps of water per day just to survive. Nine of them adhere, and one drinks more, more and more. Then others, because they're afraid that water will not be enough, they will also start drinking. And at the end of the day, they will run out of water, they will all die. Same way, if there are companies, if there are countries with good intentions, but if they're alone or if there's not critical mass of them, then in order to survive in a competitive market, they will actually have to go against their philosophy of green economy. They will have to adhere to the bad practices, quote-unquote. Okay, if I, if I could just pick up on, on that point. If, if unsustainable economic practices are contagious, then hopefully sustainable economic practices are, are also contagious. And, and I wanted to ask all of you a, a question about international cooperation. Now, you know that, that Dubai has, has taken the initiative to, to launch a, a World Green Economy Organization um, that a number of countries have expressed interest in, in joining that organization, that the private sector is very excited about this, uh, about this concept. And, um, you know, my, my, my sense is that the international scene is, is, is very, very busy. We have a United Nations Environment Program, a United Nations Development Program, a United Nations Industrial Development Organization, uh, a Global Green Growth Institute, which I used to work for. It's quite a, land, it's a crowded landscape. But that landscape is, is very much dominated by intergovernmental organizations, governments talking about what the private sector should do, governments talking about the green economy, which should be driven by the private sector. And the notion behind this Dubai initiative of a World Green Economy organization is, is to create a platform that really engages the private sector, that puts the private sector uh, in this organization at the same level of governments and drives innovation through private sector engagement. Um, if, if, if you were to, I, I would like your perspectives on, on the international landscape. And I would ask you, what would be your main advice to this organization to really be innovative and engage the private sector on change, on green economy in new ways? And I'm gonna start with you, Sylvia, if I may. What would be your advice? It's a very difficult uh, question. And uh, I think um, Mr. Under Secretary General, uh, Secretary General, Mr. Gutierrez, uh, will be very engaged in this uh, uh, issue. <laughs> Maybe uh, we spoke about uh, a reform of United Nations Organization since a, a long time. Uh, so uh, maybe it is the time. Maybe uh, our uh, our uh, commitment, our global commitment to climate and to sustainable development, are uh, the, the reason for which the most important reason for which we need to have a more efficient uh, uh, organization, global organization from. Um, uh, and all the, uh, all the organization around the United Nations. Um, we think we have to, to have a, a, a way to make the private sector more um, important. And from Italian point of view, uh, we have to make the singular countries a, a, a singular country more uh, important this uh, uh, issue. We have, we, we can, I can make example, uh, a successful example. We have a long uh, lasting history, Italy has a long uh, lasting history of cooperation as maybe you know. Uh, one of the most important was uh, since 2007 uh, with the um, Pacific Small Island Developing Countries. <coughs> since 10 years ago, we decide, uh, Italy decided to cooperate with this country, to help these countries, both in transition on renewable energies. These countries are uh, so far from, uh, and they are, uh, uh, for, for these countries, very difficult to, to have fuel. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, Italy, 
uh, helped, uh, began to help these uh, countries with the for the transition to renewable energies. Uh, this cooperation is a country-to-country -country cooperation, mm -hmm. a very successful country-to-country cooperation, um, and long-lasting cooperation, genuine, they say genuine cooperation, because this cooperation uh, suc uh, was successful, not only to give money to these countries, not only to realize uh, important projects on renewable energy, water uh, management and so on, but what is so, was and is now, now also now so important to improve capacity building of this country, to c create uh, capacity building in their own countries. And in this year we have improved this uh, way of uh, of, of, of implementing our cooperation. We have reached in the last uh, two years about uh, uh, more than uh, 30 uh, bilateral um, agreement, 30 memorandum of understanding with uh, uh, 30 new countries. Uh, most of, we, uh, of these are African countries and uh, we mm, about resources, for example, in 2016, we committed more than 35 million euros, and we have a, bu a, budget, a global budget of 100 million euros. And we are particularly committed in, to support them in renewable energies, in um, uh, development, uh, sustainable development projects, but above all, capa in, uh, capacity building to, to make these countries uh, capable of uh, with each, uh, each own uh, resources to, to reach uh, the goals of the Agenda 2030. And we think is a way uh, we can, global uh, institution will improve uh, and to prove to, to realize in other uh, occasions. Yeah, do you, uh, I mean you talked about Mr. Gutierrez, the UN system, the Secretary General. Um, the, the World Green Economy Organization is very strongly on, focused on, on private sector engagement. Yes, do, you, yes. do you see, is that an important agenda? As, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Because we, we have to help uh, pri private uh, sector to change our model of production. Our model of production and consumption we have to turn to a lean, from a linear economy to a circular economy. Yep. Uh, 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 just one thing, Italy in European context is also very committed to a new uh, directive on design because design of our uh, uh, object, uh, um, uh, design of our, our products is a way to product things and services which we can use and reuse more and more times. So we have to change our way uh, of product and consumption, our uh, way of life. Yeah, thank you. I'm getting signals that I'm standing between you and your lunch, which is not a place where I want to be. So we have to stop very quickly. But I want to give the final word to you, uh, Aisha, on this question of the international architecture um, this great initiative from Dubai on a, on a World Green Economy Organization and trying to engage the private sector. Um, do you see important opportunities to engage the private sector more strongly at an international level? Sure. So uh, we, do ha we do see, uh, or we would like first to share with the audience today and the countries who are presenting with us today, three key takeaways from UAE's experience in transformation toward the green economy. The first key uh, takeaway is that we should ensure that there is a proper combination of urban policies and legislat legislation that cuts across multiple sectors, waste, buildings, energy, and other sectors. The second one is that to have urban planning and design that takes into account the country's unique culture and the climate. And the third one is that uh, to mobilize resources to finance massive infrastructure ventures through public-private partnership. So when we look at 
the World Green Economy Organization. The World Green Economy Organization has an advantage, actually. It has an advantage that it, is, it has the equal partnership of, between the government, the uh, businesses, and the other stakeholders. So unlike the existing intergovernmental uh, organization and the interest groups, so we hope that this unique mechanism would help to focus on coming up and investing more concrete uh, multi-stakeholder pro project which can provide real solutions in many parts of the world. Businesses are only interested in delivery of results and return on investment. So we, don't, we, we are not supposed to make them complex or make their life difficult with a lot of bureaucracy or, proto or protocol. So we hope that this business mindset would guide the development of the World Green Economy Organization and many leading global companies as well as other governments and stakeholders groups will join this organization unique platforms and uh, UAE government is uh, <coughs> pleased to give a full support for the World Green Economy Organization development. Well, thank you very much. That's a very encouraging note to, to end on. And thank you to all of the panelists for your contribution to, uh, to this discussion. I'd hope that we'd have a chance to get around to questions, but we, I don't want to keep you from your um, lunch even longer. So please, could I ask you to give a warm round of applause for the panelists? Thank you.